thank you for the legacy, for the memory of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and for his sacrifice to making not just our people better, but our world better. And so God, we pray that as he's honored all over this nation and world, we pray, God, that we would remember the spirit uh, of his service. In Jesus' name we pray. Church, say amen. 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 Uh, if you'll permit me to just make um, just a few expressions before we move uh, into our sermon, certainly. I know it's already been acknowledged, but to uh, the members of Phi Beta Sigma and Zeta Phi Beta who may be here, we thank you for worshiping with us uh, on today. Amen. 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 We thank you for being here. Amen. And then also uh, on yesterday as I received a call yesterday morning uh, as it relates to our director of music, Sister uh, Broom, uh, being in the hospital and not being here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Sister uh, Daniels who I reached out to and even thank Sister Walker who has stepped in on today. Amen. Uh, to assist us and Brother Latimer. Uh, but I also want to thank Brother uh, Paul Brothers. Amen. Amen. Uh, he has uh, voluntarily served us on the first two Sundays of the month. On the sixth sun second Sunday, he actually became a member of our church. Amen. 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 Thank him for uh, his service and uh, his commitment. Amen. Amen. And then finally, I want to make mention of, of an announcement, a uh, dialogue, conversation. Uh, as some of the leaders and I were uh, at First Presbyterian on Wednesday night, Dr. Miller and I, good friends, and we discussed some things we could do together. And so what we're simply asking uh, are for the members of both of our churches uh, at your convenience to go and see the movie Selma, if you have not already seen it. And you can see on January the 31st from 1 to 2.30 in Stevenson Hall at First Presbyterian, we want to have a Selma conversation where we simply uh, talk about uh, what that particular a moment in our history meant. Those of you who may have been there or at least uh, were alive during that time will be invited to share. Then we want to move forward to our contemporary generation and discuss in light of Ferguson and other events, uh, what does the spirit of Selma mean today? Uh, so I want to encourage you, if you've not already, go and see the movie. Uh, he and I have talked about continuing dialogue between our churches, various events. Uh, so certainly encourage you to go see the movie number one. Secondly, to be there on January 31st. Amen. Amen. All right, it's time for the word. Amen. Amen. And I want you to go to Philippians, the fourth chapter, as we uh, are continuing in our series. We thank God for uh, ministers who are here and those who helped to launch our worship service uh, in my absence as I went to retrieve my wife and my son. Amen. Amen. Uh, but I want to call our attention to Philippians uh, the fourth, uh, the fourth chapter, uh, and there beginning in verse six, we find these words from Paul: "Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus." Then Paul says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Paul says, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Amen. As you are seated and certainly as you are praying with and for me as we honor the Word of God and the proclamation of the Word of God, we want to talk about the antidote for an anxiety. The antidote for anxiety. My brothers and sisters and certainly all of my Christian friends, uh, Paul here is reminding us that, that we can have peace in the midst of life's problems. Uh, life's problems uh, can certainly surround us and life's problems can certainly overwhelm us. But Paul uh, wants to remind us that we can experience peace in the midst of 
the problems of life. And I know that this subject is not limited to a few because all of us at some point in life are going to experience problems in our life. Uh, problems from without and even problems from within. Problems caused by others and even some self-imposed problems. But what we need to understand is that Paul, the writer of this very brief letter of four verses, is writing from a Roman prison. Philippians is one of Paul's, what you call, a, 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 a prison letters, along with Ephesians and Colossians and Philemon, where Paul is facing an absolutely dark and uncertain period in his life. But Paul reminds us as he is facing this dark period in his life that had it not been for the darkness, the bird would never learn to sing. And my brothers and sisters, that's what it means to rejoice in the Lord always. Whenever darkness comes in your life, you'll find that the child of God is able to have a song even in the dark periods of your life. Because as a matter of fact, when you cannot see, that's when you're more prone to acknowledge the presence of the Lord. I find often in our life that whenever we can see and we can work it out, we don't often acknowledge the very presence. The very presence of the Lord. So Paul, in our text, my brothers and sisters, wants to remind us that we can experience peace in the midst of life's problems. This particular letter, and particularly in our text, Paul is giving a call to believers, even to us, to maintain Christian steadfastness. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, the latter verses, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And so Paul gives some very practical steps that lead to the steadfastness of faith. A steadfast faith is a faith that can withstand the problems of life. A steadfast faith is not a pie-in-the-sky faith. It is a faith that can endure the storms of life. The songwriter said, when the storms of life are raging, stand by me. Paul gives some inspiring and inspired strategies for Christian stability in the midst of uncertainty. Now when Paul says be anxious for nothing, he's not saying live a carefree life. Hold on folks, want to breeze through life and never have to think about anything. Amen? Don't want to work, don't want to make no money, don't want to make no decisions, don't want to give no money. Y'all talk to me here today. Uh, Paul, when he says, be not anxious for nothing, he's not saying don't be concerned about anything. Paul is saying don't worry about anything. And what we need to understand is that legitimate concern can easily turn into sinful anxiety. Genuine concern. Legitimate concern can easily turn into sinful anxiety when we do not trust God. Amen. See, when we allow our hearts and minds to be pulled in different directions by our circumstances, and whenever we are pulled in different directions by our circumstances, it is indicative of the fact that we are not trusting God. Anything that is attempting to pull you apart cannot pull you apart if your mind is stayed on Jesus. That's why the Bible says when it relates to strongholds, understand the enemy is not concerned about your car, your washing machine, your house, not even concerned about your physical health. The enemy is concerned about your mind. The battlefield is your mind. It's not your hands, it's not your heart, it's not your feet, it's not your loved one, it is your mind. And so the Bible says that we've got to cast down every thought that would attempt to exalt itself above what God has said. And whenever we allow anything to exalt itself above God, it might be a problem, it might be a circumstance, it might be a person, then we wind up being in a stronghold. 
So the Bible says we've got to cast down every stronghold that would attempt to exalt itself against the Word of God. Now, that presupposes that you know what the Word of God is. Now, I'm operating under the assumption as I talk about an antidote for anxiety, that none of us opens our Bible on Sunday, and then we don't open it again until next Sunday. I'm just assuming. I'm assuming that none of us are praised on Sunday, and then we don't pray again until next Sunday. Somebody talk to me here today. Because if we are in that category, that means we leave room Monday through Saturday for the enemy to exalt itself above what the Word of God says. And so we wind up living anxious and worried lives. And so that legitimate concern turns into sinful anxiety because we don't trust God. Listen, faith and doubt are pulling on the road. Faith is pulling one way down the other. The key is our trusting God. Hope field pulls one way, fear pulls the other. The key is our trust in God. They are pulling in different directions, but when we're being pulled apart, we've got to trust God. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, he gives the parable of the sower and the seed. And he talks about the fertile soil and how much we allow the word of God to saturate our mind. And then he talks in Matthew 13 and 22, he says that some, because of the cares and anxieties that exist in the world, they allow them to basically uh, let the word of God flee because they're so concerned with outside situations. Jesus literally says that when we distrust God, and allow circumstances and worry to sit on the throne, we are engaging in internal strangulation. We are literally, that's why whenever you're going through something, anxiety gives you this feeling that you cannot breathe. It's an internal struggle that, that makes you feel like you are strangling on the inside. And that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to kill your faith. He wants to kill your hope. He wants to kill your trust yes. in God. Yes. But listen, Paul, when he talks about this antidote for worry, says that we've got to take worry off the list and put prayer on the list. See, see many of us, we spend so much of our time making our things to do list. I mean, we develop so many lists of things we need to do, things we haven't accomplished. We really are amassing a worry list. Paul says, do not amass a worry list, but take the things you worry about and put them on the prayer list. Charles Kingsley said so many years ago, uh, do today's duty Fight today's temptation. Yeah. Do not weaken and distract yourself by looking forward to things which you cannot see and you could not understand even if you could see them. Yeah. And so my brothers and sisters, we need to understand that we live in a society where anxiety is prevalent. Yeah. Anxiety is prevalent in our society. We, we literally live and worship the God of Tectopia. Our golden calf is technological utopia. We think we can create and invent enough technology to make life peaceful. But that which we create winds up making us more anxious. Many of us become just like Dr. Frankenstein, who created a monster. And that same monster he created, with his smartness in chemical biology and chemistry, wind up being the bane of his life. All of us have become like Dr. Frankenstein. We have built this technology utopia, and that which we have created has made our living that much worse. Paul, my brothers and sisters, says 
that we need to certainly prohibit some things in our life. Paul wants us to understand that anything that comes in our life directly from God is a reason for thanksgiving. So Paul says that we should rejoice, rejoice whether we like it or not. He said we should pray whether we feel like it or not. And Paul says we, could, we should focus on positive things whether we want to or not. So the first thing we see as an antidote for anxiety, Paul says that peace comes through rejoicing. Peace comes through rejoicing. Paul says that we ought to rejoice in the Lord, not in our circumstances. See, many of us rejoice more in our circumstances than we rejoice in the Lord. Y'all, come on, don't leave me. It's testimony time. And when it's time to give testimony, we talk 15 minutes about what we're going through. And then at the end, we say a little something about God. We are rejoicing in our circumstances. When you testify, talk about the goodness of God. Not about what you've been through. Because you're not what you've been through. You're what God says that you are. So you ought to rejoice. In the Lord, Paul says in verse 4. Yeah. And Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then emphatically he says, again, yeah. I say rejoice. Yeah. Not in your circumstances. See, some of us like being in a pity party. Oh, because it gets us attention. Oh, Somebody talk to me here today. Now, I'm not, I'm not just going to deal with the person who likes the pity party. I'm going to deal with us who celebrate the person in the pity party. The reason why folk like being in a pity party because we'll pay more attention to folk when they talk about their misery than when they are given a celebratory congratulation of God. Somebody talk to me. Peace comes through rejoicing in the Lord, not in your circumstances. Peace also comes when you realize you got to rejoice whether you feel like it or not. See, a lot of us, we have a very superficial way of worshiping and praising God. It's predicated on how we feel. But true, authentic worship and praise is not based on how you feel. It's based on a relationship. And when you've got a relationship, that relationship is more than what you are going through. Somebody talk to me here today. So you've got to rejoice. Whether you feel like it or not, that's how you'll see how peace comes through rejoicing. But the second thing Paul says is peace comes through praying. Paul says you've got to give, my brothers and sisters, your worries to God. Because God cares for us. 1 Peter 5 and 7 says, cast all of your anxieties, your worries, your cares upon the Lord. Because the Lord is the one that cares for you. The Bible says that we ought to submit ourselves to God. And the Bible says that there is an enemy that is running around seeking who he may devour. But the Bible says commit our cares to God and he will exalt us above our situation in due time. Peace comes through praying. And I find the church does a whole lot of things. But the people of God don't pray no more. If the people of God were praying people we realize that circumstances are not too hard for God. The Bible says over and over again, is anything too hard for God? And my brothers and sisters, I submit to you today that if your problems are big, your God is too small. But if your God is big, your problems will be little. Thirdly, peace comes through focusing on the positive. You know, some folk you hate to see coming. They ain't never got nothing good to say. Somebody talk to me here today. Paul says peace comes through the positive. Paul said you got to recall God's goodness because good things are uplifting. We all want to hear a good word every now and then. And so Paul says focus on some good things. When David was going through his situation and everybody else was being negative, Paul David said, sometimes you got to speak to yourself. When nobody else is saying anything good, you got to speak good stuff to yourself. Sometimes you got to 
got to be in a sanctuary in your own heart and allow yourself to be picked up by worshiping God all by yourself. But then peace comes through trusting God's presence. Because Paul says in verse 9 that the God of peace will be with you. God is never far, my brothers and sisters. No matter what it is that we are going through, we serve a God that is never, ever very far from us. A hurricane is a storm with very cyclonic winds that can exceed 74 and 75 miles an hour. As a matter of fact, in order to be categorized as a hurricane, a hurricane must exceed 74 or 75 miles per hour. But along with that wind, there comes rain and thunder and lightning. And, and usually, uh, they, they, they have come with some very, they come with some very devastating winds. Hurricanes can be fierce storms with relentless powerful winds. And the fascinating thing about a hurricane is the eye of the hurricane. The eye of a hurricane is a place of perfect calm. In other words, in the eye, you won't find any wind. You won't find any thunder. You won't find any lightning. You won't find any storms in the eye of the hurricane. The winds may be blowing all around, but in the eye of the hurricane, there are no storms. And my brothers and sisters, the same is true with all of us. When Jesus is in the center of our life, and when our eyes are fixed on Jesus, the storms of life may be raging, but when Jesus is the center of your joy, there is peace and calm in the midst of life, darkest storm. Paul is saying that when our eyes are fixed on Jesus, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. God will give you peace in the midst of your storm. He says the Spirit of God will garrison, that's a military term, it will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Listen, the reason Paul says that is because he knows the enemy is attempting to attack your mind and eventually get to your heart to affect your ability to trust in God and your passion for God. Paul says you got to guard that stuff. And a lot of us, we treasure and guard a lot of stuff that really don't matter. But Paul says if you pray and allow God to guard your heart and mind, you can rejoice in God no matter what you're going through. You may be in a storm. You may be in the dark period of your life. But trusting in God will enable you to make it through with peace in the midst of the storm. The Bible says in Psalm, Psalm 46, God says, be still and know that I'm God. And somebody needs to simply be still today. Storms are raging in your life. Circumstances abound that are attempting to overwhelm you. But as the tide of adversity is rising, the Lord is saying, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. When the tidal waves of, of, of life are abounding, the Lord is saying, come unto me. All you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Be still and know that I'm God. My brother, my sister, there is a man by the name of Jesus Christ who died on the darkest day in history. He died a death not for himself, but he died for the sins of the whole wide world. And I don't know about you today, but I'm glad that God demonstrated over 2,000 years ago his love for me. That when we were all at our ugliest point, he died for us on Calvary's cross. He died on a dark Friday, but early Sunday morning, the sun got up before the sun asked you in and now darkness has been pierced with light and so we preach the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ because he is the lamb slain for the foundation of the world and so if you're here today deacons as you're coming as we extend this invitation 
those who are outside of the ark of safety to come and give their heart and life to Christ. It's a candidate for baptism, simply meaning you've never publicly professed your faith in Christ, acknowledging the sinner in need of being saved by grace that comes through Jesus Christ. Paul said it is by grace that we are saved, not of works, so that no one can boast. And if you're already saved and without a church home, we extend this invitation for you to become a member of our wonderful church and by Christian experience or by letter. Won't you come? <laughs> 